in the year of our Lord, 1187. Despite the best efforts to preserve it by Baldwin IV, King of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, the holiest site of Christianity, falls to the hands of the Muslim Ayyubids and their Sultan Saladin. Hearing of this woeful news, the old King of Germany and Emperor of the West takes up his sword for one last campaign. Frederick von Hohenstaufen was born in the mid-December of 1122 in what is now the French province of Elsass, at the time a very German province. His father, also named Frederick, but I'll call him Fritz, happened to have ruled the Duchy of Swabia in the Holy Roman Empire, and was the head of the House of Hohenstaufen, sometimes known as the Ghibellines by the Italians. When Frederick was growing up, he saw the Holy Roman Empire, the largest geopolitical entity in Europe at the time, go through serious turmoil. The previous imperial dynasty, the Salians, had died out after Emperor Henry V died without an heir, which raised a great question of succession. Fritz put his name in the ring, but as always the nobility ruins everything, and instead elects Lothar von Supplenberg as the new emperor. You should know this because it won't be the first time Frederick faces instability in the HRE. Young Frederick was given the standard education of the sons of German nobility, learning to command troops on the battlefield, fight with a variety of weapons, and most importantly, horse riding. A far cry from the liberal education of another crusade king we've gone over. This was important since Frederick was the son of Fritz, so he was also the future Duke of Swabia, so being a competent warrior was important for this future German lord. Meanwhile, to the east, the Second Crusade was called over the capture of the city of Edessa by the Zengid Sultanate, and, being a true pious Christian, Frederick lined up to participate, joining with the new emperor, Conrad III, who happened to be Frederick's uncle, yeah, Lothair kinda died and only left a daughter behind, so you know how that song and dance goes. But before Frederick can participate in the holiest of causes, there are internal affairs to settle, as Fritz, the previous Duke of Swabia, was dead, making Frederick the new Duke of Swabia. As such, he had to quickly return home to lock that position in, before finally setting out for the Holy Land from Regensburg, the imperial capital at the time. Long story short, the Second Crusade was an absolute disaster. There were floods, the Crusaders were nearly destroyed by Turkic raiders, they changed the goal from liberating Edessa to Damascus, and gave up halfway through. But while the other Crusaders were contemplating their failure, Frederick was taking notes. While on their way back, Frederick was with Emperor Conrad when he signed a deal with the Byzantine Empire to launch a two-pronged attack on the Norman Kingdom of Sicily. This is important because the Sicilians will be very important for later. Frederick then returned to Swabia and began to consolidate his own authority there, but once again there was trouble in the Empire. That's right, another succession crisis, as Conrad's eldest son, Henry, died prematurely, and his other son, also named Frederick, was like, free, so the German nobility wasn't like seeing a boy as king. Frederick probably decided at this point to make the move to take the imperial throne, because it was either him or God forbid the Guelphs, a historic rival of the Hohenstaufens. Not to say that their rule was bad, Henry the Lion was a chad at every level, no doubt. So while in Bamberg in Bavaria, surrounded only by the bishop of the city and Frederick himself, Frederick was named emperor by Conrad, beginning the reign of the greatest German monarch, unless you count Charlemagne. When the princes of the empire convened, and Frederick relayed the elite emperor's will, he was immediately proclaimed as King of Germany and King of the Romans, but not emperor as that title was bestowed by the Pope himself. About that. Upon his ascension, Frederick was beset on all sides, Guelphs to the north, Sicilians and hostile popes to the south, French to the west, and an ungodly mess of Slavs, Balts, and Magyars to the east. Frederick would sort them all out. Starting with his work immediately, Frederick settled the Treaty of Constance with Pope Eugenius III, where Frederick would help the Pope beat up the Sicilians and keep the Eastern Roman Empire out of Italy, and put Eugenius back in control of the city of Rome, 
as at this time some filthy communist called Arnold took the Eternal City and made it into a commune of Rome. Anyway, Frederick would do all this in exchange for getting his coronation as Emperor, which he didn't need papal consent for, but let's not worry about that. In preparation for his campaign against the Normans, Frederick marched into northern Italy, which by now has been gaining silly ideas such as autonomy and self-determination. <laughs> Ridiculous, am I right? Anyway, the Italians didn't take too kindly to this, and cities such as Milan rebelled against his rule. Won't be the first time. Anyway, Frederick put down this tomfoolery, even destroying the town of Tortona in Piedmont for the crime of daring to mix French and Italian cultures. I know, terrifying. Frederick then captured the city of Pavia, the capital of the Kingdom of Italy at the time, where he was crowned as King of Italy, passing through Tuscany and asserting his dominance over the Italians, who are used to it by now. Continuing south, he prepared to fulfill his promise to the new Pope Adrian, arriving in Rome and executing the commie Arnold, ending the Commune of Rome. Jesus Christ, just saying that makes me sick. Frederick was now formally crowned as Emperor of Rome in 1155. Frederick began his reign in 1152, just to highlight the bullshit that is people imperial power sharing. This site is superior, by the way. Having been deprived of their commie duce, the plebitariat of Rome rioted, but, as a true Roman, Frederick crushed the riots and put the plebs back in their place. With all but one of his goals accomplished, the first of Frederick's Italian campaigns was a marvellous success, but the failure of the Sicilian campaign due to Guelph sabotage was most concerning, so Frederick turned to consolidate the imperial authority in Germany next. This is where the head of the Guelphs, Henry the Lion, approached Frederick, and despite being a Guelph, the two were cousins, and Henry was one of the good ones so he was given the Duchy of Bavaria alongside his Duchy of Saxony to rule as a show of friendship, making Henry effectively Frederick's right-hand man. With the German lords secured behind Frederick and Henry, and a second marriage gaining him the Duchy of Burgundy, Frederick prepared to march into Italy once again. Why, you might ask? Sicily, that's why, this time enjoying much greater support from the German lords. To a usual Italian campaign, some major North Italian city causes trouble, this time Milan, they get stuffed, and Frederick continues south, with Frederick making it clear that if the Italian cities kept giving him shit, he just crushed them over and over and over again. However, it had been a long time since Italians could understand rational arguments, so they just threw a hissy fist again like they always do. Among these Italians were the people of Crema, who alongside their leaders rebelled against the Empire forcing Frederick to spend the rest of his campaign besieging the city. As this happened, the Pope died. Normally, the Emperor shouldn't give a shit about this, but he was forced to give a shit when Adrian IV was replaced with the anti-Pope Alexander III, a vehement opponent of objective imperial superiority. He was an Italian, you see, unlike Adrian IV, who was English. So that explains the sudden 100% increase in copium usage. However, Frederick has already elevated the real Pope, Victor IV, alongside the Cardinals not already corrupted by Papist shilling. He then condemned Alexander for threatening to shatter the harmony of the Catholic Church. And I shit you not, the first thing that the anti-Pope did was ally with Sicily of all countries and spread anti-imperial sentiment in the north, causing further unrest, prompting Milan to once again revolt against Frederick. Frederick besieged Milan, and after a long siege, finally got the fuckers to surrender. Frederick then punished Milan for the crime of rebelling against their German overlords, having much of Milan destroyed as retribution for their rebellion against that which was holy, Roman, and imperial. This prompted other rebelling cities in Italy to surrender, ending the Second Italian Campaign. Finally enjoying some peace, Frederick turned to actually governing his empire and making it a better place for its people, beginning the 12th century Renaissance, a great revival of philosophy, art, and culture after the Dark Ages that came before it. Central to this was Frederick creating the University of Bologna, the first university in all of Europe, with the model he created for it being imitated by later universities across all of Europe. Frederick also began to revamp the legal system, where previously the law was based on Germanic and church law, Frederick, proving himself and his empire as the true successors to Rome, reintroduced Roman law to the land, such as the Justinian Code. And approximately five seconds after actually ruling, Frederick got news that, you guessed it, the Italians were fucking around again. 
being such pains in the asses that Frederick was forced to return north and gather an even than larger army just to put these Italians in their place. But rather than swats the local rebellions like before, Frederick headed towards the source of the unrest and deposed the anti-pope once and for all, capturing Rome shortly after. I mean, what do you expect? With Germans fighting Italians, not even a contest. Frederick then placed a true pope into the Vatican, this time Pascal III. But Alexander, coping harder than ever, prayed to the devil to strike the emperor's army with disease, which the devil happily did, taking hundreds of Frederick's men. And what's worse is that the Italian rebellion in the north, which had been limited to parts of Verona, has now extended to the whole plain of Lombardy, creating the Lombard League. Frederick then returned to Germany once again, building up his armies to once and for all destroy the Italian resistance and raise the eagle standard high over Italy. Frederick spent six years preparing for the final campaign, raising funds, strengthening his authority across Germany, especially to the east, and relying on his local ally Henry the Lion. But if only he foresaw what would happen next, as in the shadows, the wealthiest of Guelphs conspired to sabotage the campaign once again, using Henry as a scapegoat. The fifth Italian campaign finally began, with Frederick bringing 10,000 men, facing off against the whole of the Italian peninsula. The Italians gathered over 20,000 plebs to face Frederick, so Frederick requested reinforcements, but due to Guelph sabotage, the reinforcements were severely shrunken, and Frederick would have to make do with what he had. Henry the Lion also failed to appear, sowing seeds of suspicion in the Emperor, when in reality, Henry was, was just dealing with the Guelph bullshit of his court while trying to gather his army. Two armies finally clashed at Legnano, with the Lombards' recon cavalry clashing with the Imperial vanguard, forcing the Lombards to flee. The Imperial army clashed into the Lombards' lines and routed the Lombards' cavalry, but couldn't give chase to finish them off. The Imperial Cavalry crashed into the Lombard infantry, but the Italians formed a phalanx-like formation. Despite this, the Imperials had the upper hand. They were just one push away from breaking the Lombard lines, but now his time has run out. The previously routed cavalry and Brescian reinforcements crashed into the Imperial flanks, dealing devastating damage and nearly killing Frederick, as he saw firsthand the chaos and brutality of what the Italians had become. Frederick was knocked off his foot horse, facing death, and his army fleeing, believing that he had died. Frederick was enraged by the barbarity of the Italians, and slayed dozens before being forced reluctantly to flee. The Battle of Legnano was lost. Frederick was devastated by this. His dream of a united and strong empire was shattered. Forevermore, the Italians would be the eternal enemies of all that was holy, Roman, and imperial. Though it wasn't all bad news, the battle had exhausted the Italian strength, and now came to the negotiating table to discuss a new order in Italy. It wasn't what Frederick hoped for, but eventually he signed the Treaty of Venice, bringing an end to Frederick's Italian ambitions. Returning to Germany, Frederick was lied to by the Guelphs that the campaign only failed because Henry the Lion didn't show up. And so, buying into this lie, Henry the Lion was tragically banished from Germany, with his lands being partitioned between other German lords. Frederick then continues to rule, marrying his son to a Sicilian princess, opening the possibility of a personal union in the future, and even discussing a joint invasion of France with England. But as Frederick entered his old age, it was his devotion to Christ and the swords that motivated him most. The Kingdom of Jerusalem was threatened, with destruction by Saladin and his Ayubid horde. Frederick, alongside his fellow Christian king, joins together for a great crusade. The journey was harsh, but Frederick showed Europe how a real crusade is done. He brought the Byzantine Emperor to his knees, granting Frederick free passage to the east. He sacks the Seljuk capital of Konya, installing a friendly sultan there, and marched all the way from Germany to the Holy Land, something that his predecessors could only dream of doing. How cruel fate can be. Just like the old king of Jerusalem, Frederick too would never be able to secure the Holy Land for Christ, as just before he could begin his campaign, he passed away tragically in 1190. After his death, the German contingent of the First Crusade melted away, apart from a small group who made it to the Kingdom of Jerusalem, later forming a hospice with papal approval, later becoming the Teutonic Knights. The life of Frederick Barbarossa was one of triumph and tragedy, 
he built the strongest empire since Charlemagne, only to see it fall apart within a generation. As though his successors of the Hohenstaufens were strong, when the dynasty died out, there was nothing to prevent the empire from total collapse. And so, Frederick lives on as the greatest monarch in German history. Crusader, emperor, warrior, and internal proof that the empire was indeed holy, Roman, and imperial. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. Just as a post note while I'm writing this script, I sincerely hope that this video came out earlier than last time, and I'll continue to make sure that I upload more and better videos more frequently. Until then, goodbye.